just to keep you awake, we wanted to give you a very light, very simple topic, something you would see like on HGTV, along those lines. It will kill or harm you, and it's in you, that you right there, it's in you, don't worry, got it. we got an off switch. It's in you or your home with Ryan Satterfield. Give Ryan a warm welcome, because he's dangerous. And that off switch could kill you, but I'm not on HGTV. That would be cool, even though that's sort of a sucky channel. Okay, so today I'm talking about what David just said. And one of the issues I'm discussing is concerning because it's capable of killing more people than several mass shootings combined by a push of a button. This is factual and based off a situation I was in and I hate it. And no, I don't have slides because I didn't feel like making them because I was working on trying to make this great. I am hoping that by talking about these issues today, people will want to take action, research more, and protect against these issues when developing systems and fix these issues to prevent travesties if they are deployed. Now, what am I talking about? I mean, why the heck am I up here, right? I'm talking about how easy it is to hack or access electric grids, uh, devices in your chest, like medical devices, and light bulbs that can literally explode that are connected to the internet. So why am I qualified to talk about any of this? Anyone could talk about anything, right? Well, I've legally hacked, threat modeled, or accessed the majority of what I'm discussing here today including the device that was in my chest, which I uh, am going to be discussing. And I'm running a conference only accepting talks that harm, kill, or assault the user, excluding monetary damage, called Critical Con, and we're accepting talks. And I'm also a member of the Calvary, so no, there are no zero days that aren't already public. And public, I mean, when I say public, I mean the hacker community probably doesn't know, but the medical community does know. So it's probably new to you. Um, so a while back, I just want to know, how safe is the world's critical infrastructure? So unfortunately, in under 60 seconds, I found a link into an airport's infrastructure. And this is a SCADA system but I didn't find that very interesting. And so I kept looking, and w what I found was equally fascinating, terrifying, and oh no, if I report this, I'll be killed because that's how this government handles these types of issues. So I, ac I accessed legally another country's electric grid. I say accessed, not hacked, to distinguish the difference of being able to get administrator powers over an electric grid for a large swath of a country by simply using Google Cash, of all things. Come on, crying out loud, protect against that. And by doing that, it gave me their admin side and the ability to shut down power for a large portion of the country. What I did was, not a hack in my opinion, and not by most of our opinions. And that is troubling, that the, the, that is troubling. Now, since I was on Google's property and not their property, the entity that would be in trouble was Google, not me that's viewing the thing that Google took. It's very nuanced, but that's how law is. So the amount of data you could access at the time has now dropped by half a billion search results because I worked with Google and law enforcement to on this issue, and I'll expand further on that. Now, back to the electric grid. The admin side was like looking at the 1990s. Seriously, like flashback mode. Maybe if we brought up Layer 1 from 1999, it would look like that. But Layer 1 probably looked better. It had a... Uh, the site had letters scrolling on the top of the page telling you where you were, and below had nice little squares of the names of areas that covered a very wide area of the population, followed by a nice little button that said shut down for each one of the name of the 
area, cities, and everything. That's just lovely. Now, for an admin, that sounds nice. If you're an administrator, you want things to be straightforward. But whoever did this didn't think about their threat model. The threat was every hacker in the world and their security to deal with all those hackers was to kill them, literally kill them. Their, their threat model was only, only worked for the hackers within their country and the promise of death. Based on the hackers in that country and what I know, I would have to say that policy is probably working very well. And this policy was on all government websites of said country. And because none of those hackers in that country, they aren't protecting against that and they aren't talking about that, these type of issues. Now, hackers from that country are talking about more trivial issues that don't bother their government. But what I say to the governments of the world is you need to be bothered a little if something endangers your population's freaking life. So, so what if we find it? If we tell you, you need to fix it because someone else can come along and kill everyone if that issue allows you to be killed. So stop threatening and kill us and try and protect your people. Now, how, now, I already told you that this country had it in their fine print. They even put it in their headers. They, put the, they took the time to put it in their headers that they'll kill you and rather than, fix, than try and fix their issues. That's just lovely. Um, so I wasn't incentivized to contact this country at all. Rather, I, um, cause I, sort of, I sort of think being alive is interesting. I've been, I've been temporarily dead a few times. That was really boring. So being alive is too interesting to, to try to contact the uh, country that's going to kill me. So I contacted, with all that combined, I talked to the FBI about it since I was already working with them on another SCADA issue. Um, so it took, no, nope, if you contact our law enforcement, you think they could talk to the other country to get fixed real quick, right? Well, since this isn't a close ally, it took six months to fix this issue, and during that time, anyone could access their grid. But it still got fixed. That's the positive side. Some things never get fixed. Now, how is being able to shut down a large loss of power of a country a life or death scenario? That's a good question. I mean, it has to be asked. Any form of system to direct traffic was shut down, which would lead to car accidents. Further, let's look at this country's inability to have the majority of their hospitals have generators. So shutting down their power for a long period of time might result in death for those on automated life support in certain areas. Even a short period of time is enough to cause chaos at the hospitals, not be able to triage properly, resulting in death. Death in a, in a click of a button is no longer a joke for the tabloids like it was in 1999 for the Enquirer. It's rather a real life, if I got the paper wrong, I'm sorry, but it's rather a real life issue now and we have to update our threat models due to this. Now, how do researchers, how do researchers, um, find this information? Well, I'm just, the way I got a lead on it was a now defunct site called Strange Scatter Love that helped locate this information, and then I wrote my own personal guide for the information, but I'm not allowed to share that information today, unfortunately. I apologize for that. Because it's SCADA, so it's critical infrastructure talk, and I was told not to discuss that part of it, unfortunately. Now, if you run into issues like this, be careful in how you report these issues. Because did you break the law to access these systems? If so, I wouldn't tell law enforcement, nor do I encourage you to break the law, or anyone else in this room, or anyone on, watching this on YouTube. This is something I had to think through and rationalize reporting to our law enforcement, and plus since I was already handling another issue, like I, like I said, I had an easy point of contact. Getting things to the government is a bugger and a half <sighs> without having friends who have points of contacts or you yourself having a point of contact. 
if you believe what you found is worth a potential jail time, even if you broke the law, then make your decision and live with it. And simply doing threat modeling from my point of view on how to live your life. But you ultimately decide how you should live your life. No one else can tell you how to, do, how to live your life. Now, I can say that in instances like this, coordination and cooperation with law enforcement, that is, if you have the proper channels, is more powerful and safely solving issues than any blog post ever will be. So, now let's move on to what I call abnormal weaponry. I had a device called a vagus nerve stimulator in my chest that's connect, that was connected to my brain. You guys can see this wire right here? It's an RF transmit coil that connects to my brain. Well, I had that device removed a few months ago. That device had some problems, and, but it wasn't interconnected in the sense that most think IoT devices are, nor are the newer models. Rather, it was is only supposed to be accessible by a couple feet of the user. And you can make the device send electricity to the brain when you aren't expecting it if there's enough uh, mag magnetic energy. Uh, it took a 50 gauss magnet to activate it and, and just reboot, reboot, reboot. No authentication in place, just magnets, which is pretty weak. But that's that's not a major issue because they have a set of little problems. So this device is actually, in my opinion, pretty secure, but let's go on to see other problems in it. It's accessible via radio frequencies, and they have something they call a wand that updates the software, deactivates it, changes the voltages, etc., which requires access near your chest if you're using their system. So sure, if you're if you're within a couple of feet of someone, someone's chest, you could turn their device off. And sending them their doses of electricity to the vagal nerve more often than they're supposed to get. But that's extremely close, unless you're doing something really crazy that you can send it further away. And for hackers, we're crazy. We probably could find a way to do that. This device can send more electricity than is meant to, and I know that by not hacking it, rather certain commands appear to have gotten overridden when my lovely insurance company, which I do appreciate, but I don't appreciate for this, decided replacing my batteries in my chest wasn't worth paying for. The device didn't know how to handle the unexpected amount of energy from the batteries, which shows how well the company plans for unexpected input. Due to the improper metal electricity, the device seems to have potentially triggered some commands in the system that are probably left over from debugging and took the company an extended period of time to figure out how to fully shut it down. Since there appeared to no longer be a cap on how much electricity would be sent to my brain every five minutes, I stopped breathing every five minutes when it was programmed to turn on. If I didn't have a 50 gauss magnet taped to my chest, that is why battery replacement is very important when building devices and because and battery and, and, and long lasting batteries so those don't have to be replaced because that's an important step to protect people against these devices going crazy. Now, you need to have a system in place that if it isn't life critical, meaning you will die if it turns off, to deactivate something. If it is life critical, you need a way to warn the patients far before shutdown will occur, and you need to explicitly be clear with insurance companies that the batteries will be replaced. Now moving on. A simple unauthorized access hack that's been known to all the patients and doctors in the medical field for nearly 20 years is a little frightening, but not that frightening because it would cost about a million dollars to do it you would need about almost three Tesla, st the strength of three Teslas to be able to fry this RF transmit coil because until recently they did not do shielding in this coil. And this coil is connected to my brain. So if you fry the vagal nerve, I'm just like this, but still alive. So you can really, you can really, kill, you can really kill someone or highly mess them up this way. Now, 
With all the disclaimers aside, I still think this is one of the safest devices out there. Our former vice president, I believe it was Cheney, had to have his pacemaker modified to avoid attacks that would have killed him. One person wrote about how they had to have a medical device put in them that has Wi-Fi, and they now fear for their life, but they did it because it was the only thing to save their life. Now, what stood out to me was when they had it installed, the doctors didn't have a section of the problems cybersecurity-wise, which they should have. Rather, they only found out about the issues after it was in them and after it was installed, and there's nothing they can do about it unless they have it uninstalled and then they die because they rely on the, I believe it was a pacemaker. Now, if a popular brand of pacemaker was attacked by remote code execution, if it was, they could potentially have people dropping dead, which we all know, but it's unfortunate because it's easier than that. As Hacker News notes, you can simply kill some patients in the hospitals through their infusion pump. <sighs> which is a certain brand is IoT, and the CERT, which is an arm of the DHS, as most of us know, handles internet security issues, and they send out a warning about this pump because people could be killed by it, by overdosing and other issues. So, that's just lovely. We need to think about what we're building, folks. So, don't fear though. Some doctors are actually starting to care about protecting your health from every angle. But the most important part to them is being able to save your life from a non-internet security threat, or as they might say, cybersecurity threat. Both have to be adaptable. Hospitals have to be, hospitals are very vulnerable because in every sense of the word, they have to be able to do their job and every second counts. But they also need security so someone remotely can't kill their patients. It's a delicate balance that needs to be fixed and hopefully we can, hopefully some hospitals will start working in unison with researchers to fix the devices while and or just get them fixed from deployment and then they can focus on what they need to focus on. So I find it to be our duty to try and educate others on what needs to be done. Now let's switch off to IoT devices. Mm, the thought, uh, the, I was, a company hired me to hack an IoT device. And I thought that crossed my mind was, since this is sold widely to the masses, what twisted thing could some crazy hacker do with it? Well, I thought, it wouldn't accept more voltage to the light bulb than, than the light bulb was supposed to output, right? Right, we wouldn't do that, right? No, no wrong. My co-author, which I forgot to ask permission to say his name so I can't say it, my co-author and I ran the attack as proposed within the safe confines of a metal box and the glass shattered everywhere from the light bulb. Light bulbs are by people's beds. They're, they're everywhere in your home. Those type of attacks are not acceptable by any means of the imagination. Now, if you're willing to offer a location for more hazardous, absurd testing, things catching on fire and such, let me know, because there's some stuff I want to completely blow up to make, sh or try to blow it up to prove or disprove how safe it is to, to and let everyone know. Um, my Twitter handle, from a company as Planet Zuda, and mine is I underscore AM underscore Ryan underscore S. So I did say in the description I was going to talk about a way to blind people and make them vomit. I'm going to talk about that slightly because, but I can't, I'm not gonna say how since it's not patched. There are certain frequencies people consider to be brown notes. But what if you could modify those frequencies and put code in them? So you're sending code over audio. There's programs out there to do that. Now, what happens if you change that frequency to be pretty high so it's almost outside the human hearing range? It's 
almost near sonic, ultrasonic, near ultrasonic. Well, then I put myself as a guinea pig, and I started going temporarily blind, vomiting, and had a migraine for a day every single time I did it. I was, but something like that, that got broadcasted over, say, an ad on a radio, or got uploaded maliciously to a popular podcast, could be very dangerous to people driving. I want to talk more on this issue, but until there's a fix or something, I can't. Now, I'm opening the floor to any questions or criticism, and I really appreciate everyone being here, and if you want to submit any talks to CriticalCon, um, please do so, because CriticalCon.com. Any question?